Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com. Uh, Monday, what is it, August 22nd? Getting through August here and the end of the summer and looking forward to that. Um, I used to love I used to love summer and hate winter. And now I'm the opposite <laughs> ever since. Uh, just because it's hot, construction, bugs, etc. as opposed to bad roads. But you can have bad roads in the summer too. But Anyway, I'm doing Fate's Warning album number 10 appropriately. Uh, labeled from 2004 FWX. Uh, so I only I, I count on the last video, um, and I have some videos that I haven't. I'll mention that late, maybe later. Some videos I haven't uh, shared yet that are not music related. But uh, this album FWX, or some people call it X, FWX, the third you could say proper album. I always look dark on my camera. It doesn't turn out that way. The third proper album when they were sort of a trio. I mean, Joey Vera was the bass player, and if, I don't know if they officially made him a member around this time, or uh, it was around this time, or maybe the next record. I can't remember. But um, yeah, this came out the year after the Arch John Arch EP and OSI, so it's kind of in the whole Fates Warning canon. Um, was around that time, but this is the third album with just the trio of Jim of Ray Alder, Jim Matheos, and Mark Zonder officially. Um, FWX, October 5th, 2004. So, here, I'll just show the booklet. I don't have it on vinyl. I didn't mention that I don't have Disconnected on vinyl either, as I would have shown. But, um, booklet. Um, very sort of, I can call it atmospheric. I know some people are critical of this cover. There's a couple albums they're critical of. I mean, the cover art. Lyrics, of course. Um, uh, so, but yeah, the thing I think about, I think about this for a couple reasons. Um, well, my person, I'm like, around that time, you know, I, I was doing a live journal I was using, you know, keeping, which is still up, but it's kind of embarrassing to read sometimes, but it's more for nostalgia, but. I saw, I remember this came out, I knew about this, this is going to come out rather, this summer, early summer, or late spring, something in that, May, June, July of 2004, I'm trying to remember the release date, oh that's what I also wanted to do, but the release date was October 5th, the release date of Marillion's Marbles and Pain of Salvation's B, and Pain of Salvation's B came out around the same time because October 5th was not that much after... It was recorded in April through June of 2004. So yeah, probably around probably around the early summer we heard about it. But Pain of Salvation's B came out like a week or two after the Prague Par USA Festival in 2004, which they played at, which I went to in September of 2004. It's a very significant time. I started my employment at where I currently work still. That's almost 18 years later that month. So it's like just before this. And Marbles was like the album that I was listening to the most in 2004. That long story short with that is that I, I bought the uh, U.S. version and regretted it. I didn't pre-order it like I pre-ordered the previous record. Of course, it ends up being their best record in many years. But um, no, I was going to look up, and I could do this toward the end, where I actually um, ranked this in the in the and all these albums and like my albums of the year so um let's just see i thought i yeah there it is it's not not my album of the year i mean marbles was i just that's not a huge shock i was wanting to do these albums of the year videos and maybe i still will someday um that's 2014 not 2004 this is an album though that fwx or x that is more so even than disconnected i've found is polarizing for fans and like it doesn't include the services of Kevin Moore um, wow this just looks so dark when I have this on here there that looks a little better but um yeah I had it number five I should have been looking at these all along but anyway I can go going forward um, marbles blackfield velveteen orphan land and then yeah so I mean it's that kind of tells you, you know, my feeling of it. I really like this album. I think it's overlooked, forgotten, and it's gotten a lot of crap. It's been, you know, not 
Not appreciated. Now, at the same time, I remember when it came out, there were people that, there were fans that weren't all that into both, especially Disconnected and A Pleasant Shade of Grey, that liked this. They compared it to, to Inside Out, which I, yeah. Yes and no, I suppose, in some ways. But listening to it today, I mean, it's been, I, again, I mean, I've heard some of these individual songs in the last 10, 15 years, but it's been probably at least a decade or more since I've listened to it. But I always liked it. And I stand by that. I will say there's only a couple tracks I, I'm not. Here's the track list again. A couple tracks I'm not. I'm not into. I don't think is are are like things I want to go back to frequently. And that would be um, the song "Crawl" and "Stranger with a Familiar Face." Both those songs seem to be sort of aggressive for the sake of being aggressive, and they're not punk, but they have like this weird energy. It's in. Some of the the guitar work Jim does on those, eh. but other than that, I mean, heal. Me, I forgot how much I loved heal me. Heal me, similar to some of the songs on Disconnected, has like this cool, almost Middle Eastern mystical vibe that gets really riffy and very earwormy. It has a Tool vibe to it. I mean, I'll admit it. I'm not a Tool fan, but the Tool influence works really well on that song. The way that builds, it's seven and a half minutes. Um, that song and Simple Human are both just heavy, riffy, very thick riffs, you know, banger tracks. Left Here, the first track, and Wish, especially Wish, I love the piano work on Wish and the atmosphere, are great kind of bookends. Another Perfect Day is, even though it has a kind of heavy riff, I wonder if he was listening to, like, uh, in absentia from Porcupine Tree. I know Jim Matheos is a big Porcupine Tree fan. That that riff reminds me of like Blackest Eyes a little bit, but um, it's a, it got a very memorable chorus and it's got the lyric kind of have a, a, have a kind of sympathetic message. Um, I love. I mean, that I would say among the top five or ten catchiest, sort of memorable shorter Fates Warning tracks for sure. I mean, it's up there with you know Eye to Eye and Through Different Eyes and a few others. Um, Handful of Doubt and River Wide Ocean Deep. River Wide Ocean Deep does remind me a fair amount of OSI, the first OSI, because this, again, came in, coming off the heels of OSI, and some of, you really, I had that shift and that sort of streak of Jim Matheos, the, the guitar tones, the, the sustained pedals he was using, um, it, it's, it reminds me of, but I mean, it, the atmosphere on that song and that's on a handful, a handful of Doubt is a classic ballad. I would put that along with, you know, Chasing Time, uh, the road road goes on forever. Um, Island in the stream. It's a great ballad. It's it's very moving. Uh, sequence number seven is a interesting intro track. Again, very much reflecting on what he was really in, inspired by. A lot of samples and a little bit of a sort of atmospheric, spacey kind of almost industrial. The, the the OSI element. Sequence number seven could have been an OSI track probably. But again, I don't think. Kevin Moore I should go to Discogs. I'm on Wikipedia. Well, this tells it again. It has Phil Magnotti. He's a, he's been kind of like their um, what's the guy's name from Rush? Not Skip Gildersleeve. Um, anyway, he's like been their the, the the fifth member of or the whatever the extra member of Fate's Warning. Do think they consider Joey Vera an official member at this point? I don't know if he, they did on the previous two records. I don't know. Um, all you know is you have the picture of just the three of them. Yeah, I mean, he was an official member at this point, then you could say. Um, Nick DeVirgilio, Frank Arresti's thanked. I don't know if Portnoy's in it. Bobby Jarvis on Beck, uh, interesting enough. And Portnoy, yeah. The Carriage House, they recorded at the Carriage House. So, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it, I always felt like this record came on the heels of, um, yeah, Jim Mathales played the keyboards, right? But it came on the heels of Disconnected and previously a Pleasant Shade of Grey, and, you know, to a lesser extent, you could say, you know, like I'm doing the, the Arch, John Arch EP and OSI. I mean, this is sort of spoiling a little bit of my rankings, but would I put it to be at quite those albums levels? No. But I the other criticism, I guess, I have for it, now listening to it, I do, didn't remember quite as much about this when I, my memories of it, but um, is it doesn't really flow as well as I would prefer. Now, I didn't have headphones on. If I had headphones on, it might have helped, but um, um, it, it's kind of disjointed and sort of, um, what's the word, uh, schizophrenic in some ways. It's going from, like, thrashy, heavy riff 
to ballad -y acoustic part, and the, the transitions doesn't work. I don't know. I don't know if Jim and the band would actually look back on this and if they would have changed the track list. Because I could I could reorder the track list to maybe make it feel like it, it flows better. Yeah, it was produced by Jim and Ray. Interesting. So, but yeah, I mean, FWX, it's... And it's been almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years next year, or 20, it'll be 18 years this year. It'll be 19 years. It's in two years, but it's been almost 20 years. I mean, it, it yeah, it has some of that early 2000s sort of influence of some of the, you know, we'll call it new metal. Again, a song like um, Simple Human, that that's a very punchy, in-your-face track. I remember when that single came out. That was the first single. People were saying how that might be the heaviest Fates Warning track ever. It's, like, really heavy. And... Rightfully so. I mean, it, it, the car riff is super heavy. I mean, some of the stuff on Disconnected War was of, of a similar heaviness, but um, this was more straight to the point. Um, I think Ray's vocal lines, though, other than on those two songs, Stranger with a Familiar Face and Crawl. I mean, Crawl, is it... I'm okay with it. I just think... The other thing I was thinking about is Engine, and I was talking about that in the last video, one of the last few videos, that Ray Alder, of course, joined Redemption, Nick Van Dyke, the sort of prog metal project, which I, when I listened to it, it always sounded like Dream Theater with Ray singing. Um, but he did that, I think, a little bit after that. He had done Engine, and you know, he's now he, he did the solo album, Rail solo album, and he's got A to Z, which I've been listening to the last few weeks, the last few days rather, and I'm, I'm liking it, but I'm, eh, I'll maybe do a video or do some more commentary on it soon, like in the next few, maybe tomorrow even, because I got a package today in the mail. I believe are my a couple of records. Um, of sabotage stuff, so I'll probably show that, and then maybe I'll I'll add to some of the stuff I've been recently listening to in the A to Z's bit. But I think those engine albums, which I know had a little bit of a new new metal influence, um, were kind of cr crawling their way into crawling. Their way, were kind of finding their way into some of the the vocal lines he was doing. Um, yeah, he joined in Redemption in two thousand five. He was on their f first record, but just as on like one track but um yeah engine and then superholic i i remember sampling them at cheapo and i wasn't i didn't like them enough because they had the little headphone box the red dot i remember the red dot net it was in there i think either that or i found the cd and i just listened to it maybe it was at zia records in arizona anyway i remember thinking this is okay i don't know if i want to spend money on it but now after all these years i'd like to revisit it to see if not that I'm a new metal fan. I actually watched the first episode of that um, documentary on Woodstock '99, which both Corn and Limp Bizkit were at, and Bush. But um, I don't know. Sometimes Ray just his vocal lines are so good that it doesn't the music doesn't take a backseat. I don't know. I think they've been overlooked. People forgot about Engine. Sort of like some of the side projects doing it, like the next. I'm gonna do King's X. <coughs> Doug Panic did it specifically. He's done so many side projects with people like Super Shine don't remember them and you know they could they could go for a revisiting to see if maybe they've aged better or you know an engine is one but but as far as FWX goes I I really enjoy this record and it's, you know what's your take on it you think it's just a disappointment were you one of those fans that didn't like uh Pleasant Shaded Grey and or Disconnected and found this to be better but I think it's interesting the records that have come since this record a lot of people don't think they're a mu that they're much better which I can sort of understand in some ways but I think this one sounds actually almost more modern because the thing is with disconnected and with the pleasant shade of gray they were doing such more conceptual thing I don't think Jim had done you know even OSI was supposed to be have a big long suite he had done the two the EP with John Arch which were two longer pieces and then he had done a Pleasant Shady Gay, which was one epic, and then a Disconnected, which had that 15 minute song, two epics basically, a 15 minute still remains, and like, I think, uh, uh, um, something um, of, of nothing was like, like 10 minutes or something. Anyway, he had been doing a lot of longer tracks, and I think he wanted to do a more song oriented album. Granted, I think Heal Me, which is the longest song on here, is the best song on here, but um, I think this album could successfully is a Fate's Warning album of more about songs than sort of epics. or pro It's still progressive, but in in more con in a concise way. And that's kind of why I liked it, and it was a, a nice change of pace. I can see why people might have compared it to, like, Parallels or Inside Out in a way. But I think from a production standpoint and 
from a guitar texture standpoint and some of it, it, it sort of molds sort of what Fate's Warning was becoming with the other influences that Jim, the other kind of styles Jim Thales was doing uh, really well. I just, I think, you know, eight, you know, there's 10 songs on here on their 10th album. It's kind of weird, a little nugget. Uh, but the, it's eight, I, I find other than those two tracks, the two tracks aren't the worst thing maybe they ever did, but I think eight out of 10 tracks, even sequence number seven, all work well. It's just the flow is what hurts it, but it doesn't hurt it enough for me not to like it. And when I see people just say this is a terrible, I don't know what they were thinking. Was I kind of roll my eyes because I think I think this has a lot of their best songs. Another perfect day is as good of a, as catchy of a song as they ever did. So anyway, but thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't subscribed. We'll see you next time.